and we're at the Hub Culture Paris Pavilion here at COP21. Joining me now is Executive Vice President of the Nature Conservancy, Peter Wheeler. Great to see you. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, tell us how things are going for, for TNC in regard to COP and COP21. Well, I think COP's going pretty well. I mean, TNC is uh, a small part of what's going on here, um, but we have to play our role and we're glad to. Uh, overall, the mood, we're on Thursday morning here, so we're well into the second week. Yeah. Uh, the mood's very good. Um, the mood coming out of the negotiating process, which is the cornerstone of why we're here, of course. It seems positive, although there's still some way to go over the next couple of days. Um, what's been most impressive for me has been the outside events and the kind of broad uh, understanding now that we've really got to do this and the support from all parts of society, uh, business, um, civil society, government, that we really have to get after this problem. And, and the mood is good. So it feels like the numbers have factored up. So there's this kind of intersection between climate and business and then the finance side. How are you finding that? Well, I think it's come a long way. I, I'm, 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 it's really pleasing. Um, you know, the business world has understood that um, it can't continue to operate in the old model. We're just running out of stuff. We're running out of room in the atmosphere for emitting carbon dioxide and other climate change uh, gases. Uh, we're running out of grasslands, we're running out of fresh water, we're running out of ocean um, resources like fish and coral reefs and mangroves that protect the coast. The world has kind of realized that we just have to have a whole new mindset and there are many, many um, movements within the business world that are seeking to address that. You've got some spectacular leadership from people like Paul Polman at Unilever uh, and others that are leading the way, but he's now these days he's not alone. There's a, there's a broad movement. So uh, the Nature Conservancy has long been one of the primary advocates for protecting natural resources. Um, how is that mission evolving for you? I know that you guys are doing some work around cities, which for the Nature Conservancy to be focused on cities is really fascinating. Yeah, that's right. I mean, our, our roots, of course, are in protecting land. You know, we, we are, uh, uh, 60 years ago, we started in the U.S. protecting valuable land um, that our scientists told us was uh, essential, um, essential part of the ecosystems of the world. Um, and there were people that loved that land, they just wanted to be in wilderness and uh, in beautiful places. Um, that developed into the land trust movement, which was massive. We played a small but leading part in that. Um, but these days we look um, not just at land, but at all the ecosystems that matter. Uh, so that's fresh water, uh, that's the oceans, it's the atmosphere and climate. And then in the last 12 months, we've added cities. And that may seem unusual, as you suggest, for a, a conservation organization. Um, but there's an important reason for that, and that's because um, that's where the people are going. M most of the world already live in cities, and over the next 30 years, um, there's going to be an enormous migration from rural areas into the cities. And that has profound implications um, for nature and, of course, for the way that humankind lives. And that's the other thing I think that's really changed um, about the Nature Conservancy and other conservation organizations in the last 20 years. We've realized that it's not nature or people, it's nature and people. And that interface is all important. If we try to solve the problems of nature but ignore the communities that live in, the, in, in, in those natural places, um, we're going to fail and it would be ethically wrong to even try to do so. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you're looking at development and looking after people in poverty um, in um, developing countries, you can't really do that without an understanding of their relationship with the natural resources on which they depend. They, after all, are the people that are closest to it. So on the one hand, you've got those communities that live close to nature. On the other hand, you've got the mass migration into the cities. So we have to get the cities right. Right. Very fascinating. You know, there's been a lot of big talk, um, and it's kind of scary, a lot of the, the kind of impacts that are expected and that we're already starting to see. I'd love to just hear something good. Do you have any, anything that you're optimistic about in regard to protecting these assets and these natural assets? Or yeah, can, well, it, you know, it's a good question. point it, to it, as a success? It, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, so um, there's, there's a lot that's going wrong, but the good news is that we've noticed it's going wrong. Uh, our scientists have evaluated how fast it's going wrong and where the tipping points are, mm -hmm. where the boundaries are to what we can and can't pollute into our natural systems. 
Um, and so now we have the framework for doing something about it. So that's the big picture. At the, um, at the delivery end, um, there's some fantastic successes going on. We announced um, a couple of days ago here of a debt for conservation swap that we've done in the Seychelles. Now, you might say the Seychelles doesn't sound like a big country like Brazil or Indonesia, but it is a very important country in the Western Indian Ocean. And for reefs. Uh, well, it, well, for reefs and for fisheries, and, um, and there's a, there are communities, of course, in the Seychelles that depend upon uh, those resources. But more importantly, the Seychelles um, is at the centre of a massive um, economic exclusion zone uh, that's its sovereign right, and we have arranged a financing for the Seychelles government um, by allowing some of its uh, international debt obligations to be forgiven and exchanged for a commitment to a conservation program. So what would have been the past uh, capital that would have been flowing out of the Seychelles in US dollars, in euros, to pay third-party creditors is now going to be f used to build a, uh, an endowment in the Seychelles to protect the fisheries and the other marine resources uh, which in the surrounding part of the Western Indian Ocean. This is a terrific um, model. Uh, that transaction has now been completed and the hard work of doing the conservation now begins over the next 30 years. Uh, but just as importantly, what's being done in the Seychelles is now being, uh, there's a prospect of replicating that in many other island states uh, that command such important swathes of our oceans on which we all depend. So right. this is, you know, that we're, we're very happy great, and very optimistic about this. This is a great example of why I've always loved the Nature Conservancy. That's really innovative thinking. Thank you so much for joining us, Peter. I'm Stan Stoliker at the Hub Culture Pavilion here in Paris with the Nature Conservancy. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah. Thank you.